I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'll take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 70 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 070. Now, I know the... Uh, I know the show number should be a lot higher than that because, well, I've missed like seven episodes since the rebranding. And then before the rebranding, I missed a few episodes. But guess what? That's not important. What is important is that we're here and we have a carry tip for this episode. This carry tip is, it's important to bring it out right now because a lot of people are asking how this tragedy happened. And this carry tip is situational awareness is key. In the news segment, I have an article about officers honoring the slain Houston deputy who was assassinated. There's no other way to describe it. He was assassinated while he was pumping gas into his patrol car. Now, while he was pumping gas, he let his guard down, and this allowed an armed killer to sneak up on him and then assassinate him execution style. You cannot remain perpetually on alert. If you try to do so, you'll burn yourself out and your level of alertness will be affected. Your brain has to have time to cool down. Your senses have to have time to cool down. And if you remain perpetually alert, you will burn yourself out. Now, when when you do come down off of being hyper aware or being situationally aware, you need to do this in what should be a perfectly safe environment. Maybe you do this with friends that are also the type that are alert. Maybe you do this at home. The thing is, you don't let your guard down when you're out in public. To do so is to invite disaster. Keep in mind that just one brief moment of heightened situational awareness could have saved this officer's life. But that moment didn't come, or it came too late. Now, I'm not saying the officer was at fault here. No. He may have been coming off of a long shift. He may have been about to go on a long shift and was trying to trying to keep himself where he could be alert throughout his whole shift. I don't know. Maybe he felt the gas station was a safe location to let his guard down. Maybe this is an area that he is very familiar with and he felt safe there. But whatever happened, he let his guard down. And that's only human. The real party to blame is the man they have in custody, their suspect, who the evidence points to as being the killer. Nothing irritates me more than cold-blooded murder of someone who has who has not done something to deserve it. Nobody deserves cold-blooded murder. There's a difference between putting a criminal to death and a criminal putting an officer to death. There is a huge difference there. One is done by sanction of the law. The other is done in spite of the law. I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show, and then I'm going to touch on some listener feedback. And after that, well, we'll go from there. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Well, our listener feedback comes to us from Sean, Sarah, Louie, and Kevin. And Kevin spells his name a little weird. He spells it K-E-V-E-N. I've never seen it spelled quite like that. But they all wrote in to inform the podcast that OCT posted to their Facebook page and their Twitter account. On And this po- these posts were made, I think, on September 5th. I'm recording this on September 6th, the day it was originally planned to be released. But I've had things going on that delayed me a day. And these posts basically stated that violating 30 a 30-06 posting was now a Class C misdemeanor instead of a Class A misdemeanor. The problem, as I replied to their Facebook post with, is that this provision was part of the open carry bill, HB 910, and it does not go into effect until January 1st of 2016. You got a few months to go still. The thing is, somebody may accidentally depend on this erroneous information. You have to, you have to consider the source of your information, and you have to verify that information for yourself. I... I could go through and I could do 20, 30 different things. I could make statements, but I try to make sure that my statements are accurate. 
I really do. And I tend to have evidence to back up my statements. Open Carry Texas, rather than issue a retraction or apologize for giving false information and make sure that everybody that's uh, had a chance to view that original post had a chance to view a corrected bit of information, they instead chose to, they chose to delete the post. No retraction, no correction, nothing. And that's not only bad form, that's dangerous. If you're going to give people information that could get, end up giving, getting them arrested and maybe lose their license to carry a handgun, if you're going to give them incorrect information that can cost them their freedom for nearly a year, then you need to make a correction about the content of that message when it's shown to be incorrect. You need to do everything in your power to make right what you did wrong. As a podcaster, I try to do that. I'm not always right. And you may have a hard time proving to me that I'm wrong. But when you prove to me I'm wrong, I'll not only admit it, I'll go, to, I'll go out of my way to let everybody know I was wrong. And I think Open Carry Texas needs to do the same. Now, I want to say, I want to say thank you to Sean, Sarah, Louie, and Kevin for writing in and telling me this. Kevin actually wrote in and sent me screenshots of the Twitter post, which is good. The Twitter post is critical because, you see, I'm banned from viewing their tweets on Twitter. I have to do weird things to view their tweets, and in all honesty, it's not worth my time to do so. And you may ask, why am I banned from viewing their tweets? I asked a question, a question they were not comfortable with. Go figure. Anyhow, enough compare, enough, uh, talking about OCT, taking a page out of the gun banners, uh, social media book. Let's run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. And then I'll be back with the actual topic of the show. The gun rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Well, we're going to talk about mass killings in Texas for this episode, and we're going to talk about what we know about them. You know, the shootings referenced here do come from Wikipedia articles, and please keep in mind that it is the policy of this podcast that the killers in these shootings are never to be named on the show or in the show notes. Now, all articles can be found linked either one or th one to three links deep from links I want to include in the show notes. But links to the actual articles in on the Wikipedia website will not be included because most of them, most of the links actually contain the name of the killer, and I don't want to put the name of the killer on my website. And we're going to talk about a few different shootings here in Texas. And we'll go back. We'll kick it off with Luby's Cafeteria. On October 16th of 1991, an armed suspect drove his pickup through the front window of Luby's Cafeteria in Colleen, Texas. He then proceeded to kill 23 people and wound 27 others. Among the victims killed were the parents of Susanna Gracia Hupp, or Hupp. Sorry, I mispronounced her name and... Susanna Hupp would later give testimony that would be critical in passing the Texas CHL laws. She has given a lot of testimony. She has given testimony to the United States Congress, to various state legislatures. And if you really, if you really want to see how to give testimony, then I'm going to suggest that, or if you want to see how to give testimony to a legislative body, go to YouTube and type in Susanna Gracia Hupp, S-U-Z-A-N-N-A, G-R-A-T-I-A-H-U-P-P. -P. Now, at the time of the shooting, the entire state of Texas was off-limits to the carrying of modern handguns for self-defense. And because of this, I'm not going to cover any events prior to the Luby shooting. In fact, I'm not going to cover any events prior to the CHL program going into effect other than the Luby shooting. Now, I would like to point out the killer was stopped only when he chose to commit suicide. So we have one story and one instance of a gun-free zone being chosen as a target. Moving forward, we're going to go forward to September 15th, 1999, where an armed suspect attacked an interdenominational teen prayer rally called See You at the Pole, and this was at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. 
Now, the Wedgwood Baptist Church was located in Fort Worth, Texas. The suspect killed seven people and injured an additional seven more. At this time, churches in Texas were off-limits to CHL holders, and the killer was stopped only when he chose to commit suicide. Two gun-free zones out of two stories. I'm starting to, I'm starting to see the beginnings of a pattern. We're going to go forward. We're going to go to, we're going to jump ahead. There have been, there have been a few other shootings that might qualify as a mass shooting. They may not. It depends on how you define it. But we're going to go to the next one that pops up as a bona fide mass shooting that's recognized by the authorities. And this is the Fort Hood shooting that occurred on November 5th, 2009. I remember this one because my brother-in-law and my sister and my two nephews were living on base at that time or living on post at that time. Nobody knew what was going on at the, at that time. Those of us that were not on post, like those of us that live on the far western edge of the state, we didn't know what was going on inside the base. But we did know something was going on. We knew there was a, some kind of an attack. It, we didn't know if it was an attack by a single deranged individual or if it was a coordinated uh, assault by a terrorist cell. We didn't know. Now, the attacker, which was a single individual, killed 13 people and injured 30 others. The killer was stopped when he was shot by a civilian police officer, and the injury left the killer paralyzed from the waist down. He has since been, well, I would say convicted, but he pled guilty. Now, like all, like nearly all federal properties, Fort Hood was and still is, ironically, a gun-free zone. I have been to Fort Hood, and I have not carried on posts because it would be illegal. This Fort Hood is a... Fort Hood is a massive installation, okay? When you consider an area that large and you consider what kind of problems somebody that's well organized can com- cause over an area that large, it's truly it's truly terrifying to think about it. You have to keep in mind Fort Hood is where where uh, you have tanks, you have the armored personnel carriers, you have Apache helicopters. You have them stationed there, and yet that entire base was shut down by one man who stood up on a table and reportedly yelled Allahu Akbar and then proceeded to kill his fellow countrymen. We have three mass shootings in Texas, and we have three gun-free zones. We're going to include a fourth one. This one also happened at Fort Hood. It happened five years later on April 2nd, or nearly five years later, and this was on April 2nd of 2014. Now, in this case, the shooter was stopped only when he killed himself after being confronted by an armed female military police officer. Kind of like the first one was stopped by an armed female military police officer. She wasn't military police. She was civilian police that was working security for the base or for the post. I'm sorry. Army, Army has post, not bases. I have not served in the military, but this gets drilled into me by my nephews. And my nephews are... Well, my nephews are not old enough to serve. The thing is, out of four shootings, we have four gun-free zones where they happened. Each of these events happened not only in these gun-free zones, but they ended only when the shooter either was confronted by somebody with a gun or when the shooter decided it was time to stop it and commit suicide. 30-06 and soon 30-07 signs only create areas where these events are more likely to happen. Businesses that post these signs are knowingly or unknowingly telling people they are not welcome because they are among the most law-abiding segment of the population that the Texas DPR, or not DPR, but DPS provides statistics on. In essence, anyone that posts a 30-06 and after January 1st, 2016, a 30-07 sign is telling the most law-abiding segment of the population You are not welcome here unless you are helpless because you might possibly injure or kill someone who may want to do the same to our customers or patients, depending on the type of operation, or our staff. Keep in mind that as a CHL holder, I have gone through a federal background check. I have gone through a state background check. I have even gone through local background checks because they, when you get your CHL, they request the local sheriff's departments in every county that you've worked in or you've lived in to check for warrants. Basically, they want to know, have you you got a warrant out? That's a local warrant. 
If you don't have a local warrant, well, guess what? The sheriffs will report it back. You're good. No problem. You get your license. If you have a local warrant, you don't get your license till you get it cleared up. Local warrants are almost always a Class C misdemeanor, but still, you have to get it cleared up. Now, as a concealed handgun license holder, I am far less likely to commit a crime than the average person in the public. In fact, I'm less likely to commit a crime than a police officer. And yet, I'm not supposed to be able to defend myself, my loved ones, as well as my friends, or even my host. Because that's what a, that's what a business that allows the public in to it is. They are a host to that customer. And that's... That's not something that's not something that makes sense to me. When I see a 30-06 sign, it basically tells me I am not welcome there because I am a law-abiding citizen. When I see a 30-06 or a 30-07 after January 1st, it will still tell me the same thing. It doesn't matter if the letters are are 1 inch high, 1 foot high, or 1 centimeter high. If I see that 30-06 or a 30-07 sign, I know that I'm not welcome there because I'm a law-abiding citizen. If you don't want law-abiding citizens in your building or in your business, why don't you put a sign up saying welcome criminals in plain English? I mean, you already got one up that says welcome criminals. It's just not in plain English. It's in legalese. In fact, it's in Spanish and English. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually read you the uh, English version of it. Let me just pull it up. Pursuant to Section 30-06 Penal Code, trespassed by holder of license to carry a concealed handgun, a person licensed under Subchapter H, Chapter 411, Government Code, Concealed Handgun Law, may not enter this property with a concealed handgun. Not that hard to print on a, in the right format to make it effective. All you have to do is you print a sign that says exactly what I read off there. I mean, there's a few parentheses and commas and things like that it has to be in spanish and english it has to be in contrasting colors with block letters at least at least one inch in height and it has to be con- displayed in a conspicuous manner clearly visible to the public and it's an offense un- by law that's a class a misdemeanor until 2016 as of 2016 meaning january 1st 2016 it's a class c misdemeanor unless somebody tells me to leave and i don't then it becomes a class a again <sighs> This, to me, to me, this is a very critical thing to keep in mind. You don't accidentally print a sign like this. It's not hard to print a sign like this, but you don't accidentally print a sign like this, and you don't accidentally post it. And when you intentionally post a 30-06 sign, you are telling the law-abiding citizens, you are not welcome here because you are a law-abiding citizen. You're not telling them, hey, don't bring your guns in because you might kill me. No, you're saying, don't come in here with your gun because you are a law-abiding citizen. Who does not want you to be armed if you're a law-abiding citizen in Texas? Somebody that wishes to harm you either financially or physically or possibly even mentally. Somebody who may want to protect their criminal enterprise. Or maybe they want to protect the criminals that do business with them, but they don't want to, pro- they don't want to let you protect yourself or your loved ones or your friends <clears throat> or even them, because they don't like law-abiding citizens, and they have made it evident by posting that 30 out 6 sign. That's what I walk away from a 30 out 6 sign with. You know what? I've ran it long enough. How I got into 30 out 6 from talking about mass shootings, I don't know. I had a whole different episode planned, but I'm not going to go back over that. That'd be kind of like, not only did I jump the shark and jump the track, I want to do it in reverse. I'm not going to do that to you. I think my 30 out six and future 30 out seven rant is good content, unscripted, but good content. With that in mind, here's how to get in touch with me and tell me you did not like the rant or you did not like me just simply jumping topics, or maybe you want to hear more about mass shootings in Texas because there were, there have been quite a few, quite a few I didn't cover. Mostly because they happened before the Luby's, the Luby's Massacre or the CHL program went into effect. I mean, the, uh, the UT Tower shooting in Austin, I didn't cover that. And that was a horrible tragedy. But armed citizens fired back. That wasn't a gun-free zone at the time. 
Armed citizens shot back, kept the shooter pinned down. This allowed law enforcement to approach the tower, enter the tower. They went up the tower with an armed, with an armed citizen. And when they got to the top of the tower and engaged that suspect, that citizen was right there with law enforcement putting an end to it. If I remember right, that armed citizen was a pharmacist. He had a handgun, I believe, maybe a rifle. And he went up that tower right with those law enforcement officers, and he put an end to that shooting with those law enforcement officers. Gun-free zones, 30-06 signs. They're just criminal empowerment zones. Anyways, the contact information, and then we'll be back with the news. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, our news segment's going to be kind of a, uh, we're going to cover things that we've, we've talked about. Our first news story is the, the shooting of a Harris County Sheriff's deputy has deeply affected law enforcement nationwide especially in Texas. Now, the governor requested officers participate in a red and blue light initiative. This was part of an effort to honor the fallen deputy. And officers across this great state not only honored that request, they did so willingly. They did so not because they had to, but because they needed to. They didn't need to in order to satisfy some edict from a higher authority. They needed to do it because... This was one of their own. This was, this man was a Texan. This man was a law enforcement officer, and he was one of them. I have a lot of friends in law enforcement. Now, I did not know the slain deputy. He was on the wrong side of the state for me to really have an opportunity to know him. But he wore the badge. He went out there. He put his life on the line. And one time, just one time, he put his life on the line by wearing that badge, by wearing that uniform, and he lost it. There are a lot of brave men and women out there knowing that could happen to them. They get up, they get dressed in that uniform, and they put that badge on, knowing that that badge is a target. And they go out there, and they do a job. They do a job that is that does not get them any thanks. They do a job that does not make them millionaires. They do a job that they feel somebody needs to do, and they feel that they can do it. They feel they are duty-bound to do it. And when you see a law enforcement officer and you feel compelled to raise your hand, think about how many fingers you're holding up. If you're holding a single digit, maybe you're part of the problem. If you're holding two digits in a Texas uh, steering wheel salute, maybe you're not part of the problem. Maybe if you hold four fingers up or four fingers and a thumb, maybe you're not part of the problem. Maybe if you hold your hand out, and offer to shake that officer's hand. Maybe you're not part of the problem. You know what the first step of being part of the solution is? Not being part of the problem. And that'll be in the show notes under under the headline of, or not headline, but under the category of in honor of those who put their lives on the line. Now we have another story, and this one's in the political category. Texas State Representative Diego Bernal has announced that he will make signs that are compliant with the requirements outlined in the Texas Penal Code available to businesses that want to ban the legal carry of firearms. He's going to help these businesses tell the most law-abiding segment of the population that they are not welcome there because they are the most law-abiding segment of the population. And that really sticks in my craw. And our final story, and this is the only one that I haven't touched on in some way, on a tangent. Changes to Texas law have already paid off for Houston Rocket Center Dwight Howard when he inadvertently carried a handgun into the secured area of an airport and he left immediately upon being informed of the weapon. Now he did give the handgun to an associate who took it out of the airport and then he proceeded to go back through security and go on his way. Already, not even with the law being in effect for a week. The law has not been in effect for a full week, and it has already saved somebody from being arrested and being charged and being convicted. That is positive work. That is very positive work. And you know, 
what? This is why the NRA and the TSRA are so critical. They get legislation like that passed. You know what? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to hit the audio that signs the show off. And I'm not going to do anything after the music this time. The show will be over when the music's over. I do want to thank everybody that listens to the show. I want to thank Alice Tripp, Tara Mitchell, Charles Cotton. I want to thank everybody that's a member of the NRA. I want to thank everybody that's a member of the TSRA. I want to thank everybody that went out there and they voted based on their pro-gun politics or their pro-gun political position. Good Lord, I'm getting my tongue tied. I want to thank everybody that listens to this podcast. And I want to thank Sean, Sarah, Louie, and Kevin, who spells his name weirdly, for writing in and informing me about the post on OCT's Facebook and Twitter. I want to thank everybody that took the time and checked to see if the law, to see if they had correct information. I want to thank everybody that goes out there and they share this podcast with their friends. I want to thank everybody that's going out there and they're doing something positive for gun rights. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.